Dr. Doherty here for his message. Good morning. I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I know there are a couple of you here that do. My name is uh, John Dowdy. Um, my family is here with me. My wife Hope is here along with my three children, Ellie, Brenna, and LJ. LJ stands for Little John. I'm expecting that he's going to actually follow through with that whole Robin Hood thing and actually be bigger than me in uh, probably about a couple years. I, I probably don't have that much time left. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me or turn them on to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I got to be careful up here. I, I, I'm a wanderer, so I got to, this is a pretty high up, so I, I got to make sure I don't fall down. But uh, if I do, I expect you all to laugh. Okay, this, just, just laugh at the misfortune. It, it happens. Have you ever had that feeling of sheer anxiety in the pit of your stomach? It's that, it's that kind of feeling that, that's like uh, being called to the principal's office and you don't know how bad it's going to be. You ever have that before? It's a feeling that just says, oh no, I'm in trouble. I know it's coming and I'm in trouble. You know, there are many times in my life where I have experienced such a feeling. If you knew my mother, which my wife knows. I, I experienced that many times with my mother. I experienced it occasionally on a trip to the principal's office. However, there was this one time and I, I really felt this kind of anxiety and I really didn't know what was going to happen. My wife and I, we were, we were living in Florida at the time. And I was, I was working at a Christian college down there. We had started going to a new church about, oh, it probably was about a year, maybe a year and a half. And we really, really enjoyed our church. We enjoyed the church family, and we, we loved our pastor. In fact, um, the pastor of the church there uh, had gone to the same seminary that I had went to. I, I knew him from there, and uh, his father actually was one of my seminary professors and, and worked with me at the college there. Not only was he my pastor, but he was my friend. Everything seemed to be going so well, and all of a sudden, it happened. I got a call out of the blue on a Saturday night. And the conversation really wasn't that long, but it was my pastor. It was a short conversation, but that conversation filled me with anxiety. The, you know, the stuff that just sits in the pit of your stomach, and you just can't get rid of it. All he said to me was, John, I need to talk to you after church. We're going to go to lunch afterwards. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of the worst case scenario kind of guy. That, that's kind of where my brain goes. I always think of the worst case scenario because, you know, it always is the worst case scenario, isn't it? You know, I could, all I could think of, you know, when, when he when he hung up the phone was, what did I do? I mean, are, are you guys that kind of people? You know, as soon as somebody says, we need to talk, you know, what did I do? I, that's, that's all I could think of. And I couldn't think of anything. I had no idea why he would make such an urgent call on a Saturday night to see me after church on Sunday. You know, after church when nobody else was there. That's when they, you know, kind of take people out back and shoot them, don't they? You know, you, you just, uh, it was like, oh, no. 
And you know, as bad as my anxiety was after that phone call, it was only going to get worse. We went to, to church the next morning. And I really have to confess, I didn't hear a word of what he said. I was not paying attention at all. I, to this day, I can't even tell you what he spoke on. I have no idea. Because my mind was running a million miles a minute. What did I do? Why, why did I deserve to be, to be pulled out after church on a Sunday? Why did he need to talk to me? We finally made it to the end of the service, and we waited around for everybody to leave. You know, and I, you know, for a while there, I was trying to cling to my wife, and all of a sudden, she kind of uh, goes off with his wife, and they're talking, and then, you know, all of a sudden, I'm looking around, and it seems like they've disappeared. And what I came to find out, he told me, you know, a few minutes later, he said, oh, I just sent our wives ahead to lunch. I want to talk to you alone. Oh, no, now it's really bad. He wants to talk to me alone. So as the wives are heading to lunch, my anxiety is heading to the roof. I don't know what I'm going to do. What did I do? I, have, I must have done something so bad that he needed to pull me aside by myself. This, must, this is going to be bad. This is going to be really, really bad. But I still couldn't think of what it was. So my pastor, he closed up the church, and we got in my car, and we started to pull away. And I knew this was a conversation I was not going to look forward to. I just, I, I didn't want to have it. I knew something was going to be bad. I was sure of it. And as we pulled out of the church parking lot, he said one of the most obvious statements I have ever heard in my life. So I guess uh, you're wondering why I wanted to talk to you. You think? I have been dealing with this anxiety for 18 hours. Yes, I want to know why you wanted to talk to me. And the next thing he said to me was mixed with relief and panic. And you kind of go, well, how did those two feelings kind of work together? Well, when you're dealing with anxiety, it all works together. Trust me. He turned to me and he said, I've accepted a senior pastor position in Minnesota and we're going to leave the church. You know, and in that moment, you kind of have that, whew, it's not me. And that was where my relief came in. It's like, I didn't do anything. That's great. Wonderful. And then you stop to think, and it's just like, but my pastor and my friend is moving 1,600 miles away. And I began to panic. Everything that we loved was about to change. And then the next thing he said to me was completely unexpected. He said to me, you know, John, the, the church that we're going to, they need a youth pastor. And I'd like you to come with us. You know, the conversation that I thought was going to be a total disaster ended up being a ministry opportunity. My wife and I, we, we actually ended up moving to Minnesota, and we served up there for two years. In fact, my oldest daughter was born in Minnesota. Maybe you're wondering why I shared that story this morning. Well, someone in the passage that we're going to read today had that same kind of feeling. They wrestled with those same anxieties, and I want us to feel those feelings because you and I are in a very similar position to his. I want you to remember a time in your life where you had that principal's office anxiety. And I want you to grab a hold of it and hold on to it as we look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. In this chapter we find that David... He's establishing his reign over all of Israel. 
In the prior uh, uh, few chapters, David was only recognized as the, the king of Judah. I think we kind of skip over this. We think he goes directly from Saul to David, and it, it was a lot messier than that. David is only recognized at, at the, as the king of Judah after the death of Saul and Jonathan. And Saul's surviving son, his name was Ishbosheth. You think that's hard to pronounce? Just wait till I get to the name today, and I've got to repeat it many times over. Okay? Ishbosheth, he took the reign of Israel after his father's death in battle. His ascension to the throne there was not part of God's plan because God had judged the line of Saul and declared that David was going to be the next king of Israel. And David spent years of his life flee or, uh, fleeing for his life from Saul and, and dealing with opposition from the other tribes of Israel. And in chapter 9, we are going to find David finally as king over a united Israel. By this time, Israel knows that David is king. By this time, all of the nations around Israel know that David is king. And now, David's just firming up his authority in his kingdom. If David wanted to make sure that his kingdom was secure, he needed to do what all the other kings in the area would do in a moment like this. He needed to eliminate all of Saul's heirs. There couldn't be anyone that had a claim to the throne. And by doing this, it would let everyone know that David was in charge, that David was now the guy. And David calls in his advisors in chapter 9 here, and he wants to know who is left in the line of Saul. He wants to know who's alive. However, David did something in chapter 9 that set him apart from all the other kings of all the other nations. He did something that truly showed that he was a man after God's own heart. So if you have 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to bear with me because I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in context, so I read the whole thing. So we're going to actually read all of chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1, it says, And David said, Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, well, there's, there's still a son of Jonathan. He's, he's crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodebar. Then the king sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, of, at Lodebar. And here's where it gets tough, guys. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and to his, all his house, I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. 
Then Ziba said, according to the, uh, said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will his servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table, like one of the king's sons. And, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Remember, I want you to keep holding on to that idea of going to the principal's office, having that anxiety, because we're going to deal with that same anxiety when we talk about Mephibosheth. But before we get to that, I want to understand, I want us to all understand the promises that were made. See, David called in his advisors and asked them about the remaining members of Saul's family. These family members could have been a a political threat to David. And everyone expected him to have these people brought to David and eliminated. But that's what made David so different. That's why he wasn't like all of the other kings around him. See, he didn't do things the way other men did them. David saw things God's way, and it changed how he responded to the events of his life. David was a man of his word. And when he made a promise, he followed through, even if it wasn't the wisest thing to do from a human perspective. David had made promises to Jonathan, who who really was his closest friend. And to Saul, who was the king who sought to kill him. If you want to turn with me, turn back into 1 Samuel. Because I really want us to look at these promises. 1 Samuel chapter 20. In this instance, we see an, an interaction between David and Jonathan. And I think it really does show the character of Jonathan as we look at the passage here. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, starting in verse 12, And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or on the third day, behold, if he is well disposed towards David, shall I not then send uh, and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. In this interplay here, Saul is actively trying to to kill David. He's made attempts before, And he's looking for him. And David's kind of hiding out. And Jonathan says, well, I want you to keep hiding out. Let me feel out my father. Let me see if he really does mean you harm. Because I think at this moment in Jonathan's life, he's not quite sure what Saul's intentions are. He does know after this, this one thing. He finds out how intent his father is in killing David. But see, Jonathan had protected David from the murderous rage of his father. He protected somebody he loved, somebody he cared about, somebody he considered a brother. This is where Jonathan's character comes in, because Jonathan knew that David was God's anointed king. He was to be the next king after Saul. Even though Jonathan was the biological heir of Saul, the next king should have been him, but it was David. 
He knew it. And his love for God and David overcame all of the arrogance and pride that his father was full of. Jonathan simply asked David to do him and his line no harm. See, Jonathan wasn't sure whether he'd even survive the transition of power. He said, if I survive, if I live, don't kill me. He says, I know you're going to be king. I know it's not me. And I know I'm a political threat. Don't kill me. Jonathan also says, and I know my children and my grandchildren and their children, they're going to be political threats as well. Don't kill them. David's love for Jonathan made that an easy promise for him to fulfill. But you know, Saul was still after him. Saul still tried to kill David. He still came after him and and threatened his life. He pursued him relentlessly. And I don't think any of us would have thought it unjust for David to forget that promise to Jonathan and say, no, they're trying to kill me. I need to protect myself. I need to protect my family. I need to eliminate the opposition. But you know what? David gave the same promise to the man who was trying to kill him. He gave that same promise to Saul. If you go even further in 1 Samuel, go to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 20, Saul is saying, And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king. This is Saul speaking. And that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me. And that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. David could have very easily said, you've been trying to kill me. What makes you think I'm going to do that? But he says... But the Bible says, and David swore to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. It's interesting because if you understand where this is and and why Saul is saying this, it is really because David caught Saul with his pants down. Literally. He literally caught Saul with his pants down. See, Saul had to go to the bathroom, so he wanders in a cave while he's trying to pursue David. He wanders into the same cave that David is hiding in to go to the bathroom. David has a perfect opportunity to eliminate this threat. He could take out Saul once and for all, and even more than that, he could have dealt such an embarrassing blow to shame Saul and everyone in his line to kill him in such a compromising position. But see, David showed respect for God and for the king that God anointed by sparing Saul. Saul had recognized his sin in pursuing David, and that's why he, may, he, he says this. But what we see from the remainder of Saul's life is it made no lasting change. As you look at both of these promises, the one that he makes to Jonathan and the one he makes to Saul, these promises, they make no sense, humanly speaking. David was an uncommon man because he didn't consider his life as something that he could control. He didn't have power over it. His life, his kingship, his future, they were all in God's hands. And the only way to go forward for David was to do things God's way. So David makes these promises. He makes them to a very, very clear enemy. See, David's advisors, they, they bring in a man who was once a, a rather important servant of Saul. This guy, Ziba, 
He's a rather treacherous individual. If you keep reading through 2 Samuel, he's not a, uh, a man of character, let's just say. He was a supporter of the old regime. And I'm sure that being called into the presence of the, the new king was not a pleasant experience for him. But David here, as he's firming up his authority, and, and Ziba could ha, have been seen as a threat to the new order. And he stands before David, and he does what every shady person will do in this situation. He will quickly turn to somebody else and point the finger. It's, go over there, look over there. Anything to take the attention off of him and his position. Did Ziba actually believe that David really meant kindness for the line of Saul? Who knows? I don't think he really cared. He just wanted that attention off of himself. And he was more than happy to give in and answer any questions just to save his own position. So Ziba directs John, or David to Jonathan's lame son, Mephibosheth. If you keep reading through uh, the accounts there, you find out why Mephibosheth was la made lame. He wasn't born that way. But David sends for Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, from a, a political standpoint, he was the clear enemy. He was the, the, the heir to Saul's throne. And the house of Saul, they stood in opposition to God's chosen king. Saul and, and his remaining son, Ishbosheth, they, they clearly led the people of God away from the things of God. They led them in a direction that was self-serving, selfish, and had nothing to do with what God actually wanted for the nation. Even Mephibosheth, as you see in this passage here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, even Mephibosheth recognized that he was seen as an enemy to David's throne. How do you see that? Well, David had established his capital, basically where, where he is going to rule all of Israel. He establishes his capital in Jerusalem. We're all familiar with Jerusalem, right? We know where it is roughly in the world. It's in the southern portion of Israel. It's a nice area. It's one that countless nations have fought over over thousands of years. David establishes his kingdom there. Where Mephibosheth goes is a place called Lodebar. Lodebar is in the northern portion of Israel. And it's actually on the other side of the Jordan River. So not only is Mephibosheth putting himself on opposite ends of the country, he's also trying to put a river in between him and David. He's trying to make it as difficult as possible for David to get to him. He doesn't want to be anywhere near David. He doesn't want to be in David's presence. He doesn't want to be at the end of David's sword. He did everything he could to put the distance between them because he understood that he was seen as the clear enemy. He knew it. And David brings Mephibosheth into his presence. Mephibosheth wasn't trying to overthrow David. He wasn't trying to start a rebellion. He wasn't even trying to stake a claim at the throne. And now he is being brought before David. He knew what was about to happen. He knew what the kings of the area did to families of the previous regime. In that moment, Mephibosheth was experiencing some major principles office anxiety. He didn't want to find himself there. And he even recognized with David just what his position was. He was really 
just a dead dog. He was worthless. His life was forfeit. He knew it. And as Mephibosheth is ushered into the presence of David, you have to understand that he doesn't come in boldly or defiantly or even rebelliously and say, you know what, I know you're going to do this, just do it and get it over with. I'm, I'm the son of a king. He doesn't do any of that. He's actually scared for his life. He was born into Saul's house, which made him immediately the enemy. He was lame, which meant he couldn't just run away. All he could do was accept what was about to happen to him. And like his father, like Jonathan, he showed godly character by coming before David humbly. He fell on his face and gave David the respect he deserved. He knew that da who David was and the power that he had. He understood that David had the power of life and death in his hands and Mephibosheth assumed that he was a dead man. But see, that's where mercy has a chance and with as much humility as Mephibosheth entered into the presence of David David just as boldly greeted him he called him by name and he dispelled all of Mephibosheth's fears David showed his heart and because of that he showed Mephibosheth mercy Everything about that situation from a human standpoint meant that Mephibosheth was a dead man. He didn't deserve to live in that spectrum. And yet David spared him. David shared his love for Jonathan with Mephibosheth. He shared his respect for God's anointing of Saul. And he restored to Mephibosheth all that he had lost when he had fled for his life across the Jordan. Everything he got back. Did Mephibosheth deserve any of that? No. Instead of killing him, David showed him kindness and love. According to every political rule of the day, David had every right to kill him, but he didn't. Humanly speaking, David actually would have been very wise to eliminate any of his enemies, even the potential ones. But see, David trusted more in godly wisdom than he did his own sword. Mercy was given. But I think oftentimes we confuse mercy and grace. Not only did David show mercy to Mephibosheth, but he also gave him grace. I'm sure that Mephibosheth was deeply confused by what was going on here with David's behavior. He expected to be dead very shortly after meeting David. He was confused, but I'm sure he was very relieved. Not only was he about to survive this encounter with David, but all of his inheritance was restored. And as great as that all seems to us, as wonderful as that would be, it's not the greatest thing that David did. That wasn't the grace that was extended by giving him back everything he had before. No, see, David bestowed a great honor on Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth had done absolutely nothing to earn it. See, David said, you are going to eat at my table 
always. You're going to eat at the king's table from now on. And that, that might not seem like much to you and, and to me, but, you know, what David was offering there, it said everything. See, David wasn't just inviting Mephibosheth to eat good food or to have royal company. That really wasn't what he was doing. See, in that moment when he said, Mephibosheth, you will always eat at my table, he was making him a son. See, that was a position that could only be occupied by a son or a daughter. To eat with the king. It was a place of intimacy and trust. Mephibosheth never lost his place in David's presence. And the honor of the king's table was never taken away from him. The mercy that David showed Mephibosheth took away the death that should have been expected. But David went above and beyond mercy by showing grace, by giving Mephibosheth something good he had no right to expect. Mephibosheth didn't just have his life, he essentially became a son of the king. So why did I think it was important this morning that you feel what Mephibosheth felt when coming into David's presence? Why is it so important for you to feel that principal's office anxiety? Because that's where we all stand. We are as helpless as Mephibosheth to save ourselves from the inevitable judgment that awaits us. One day, each of us are going to be called into the throne room of God. Every single one. You can't avoid it. You can't run across a river. You can't put distance between you and God. You will be pulled into his throne room one day. And you and I deserve nothing less than what Mephibosheth expected David to do. We deserve death. And yet, God made a promise. A promise that offers us life. And this promise is so old that he made it in the very, very beginning. If you go back into Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, our condition, our sinful state, was brand new at this moment. This is immediately following... Adam and Eve's fall. And God says to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. This is a prophecy of the Savior who is going to save us from sin and death. And it begins in the third chapter of our Bible. You don't get very far before we see Jesus himself. The promise of a Savior. God gave this promise to the serpent who is our enemy. He promises a savior, one who's going to save his enemies from their sin. That's who we are. We are God's enemies. Our sin sets us at odds with God. It's our declaration of war against God. And we're completely helpless to change that position before God. Nothing would change without God's promised one. And David was such a man of character that God declared David a man after his own heart. And God 
made David a a part of this great promise that we all have. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God tells Nathan to say this to David. He says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from the following of sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I had appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Make no mistake who we're talking about. We're not talking about a king that follows David. We're not talking about Solomon. We're not talking about the the numerous lines of, of those who come in the kingdom of Judah or the kingdom of Israel. We're talking about Jesus himself. This is not just a kingship over Israel. This is a kingship over all. And as a descendant of David, Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for you and for me. As that perfect sacrifice that we needed to cleanse us of our sin. To be the the payment for our sin. See, we are clearly his enemies. And yet he loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. He has every right to eliminate his enemies. He has every right to give us what we deserve. But see, God extended great kindness and mercy by dying for us. He wants us all to believe that Christ died for us. He wants us to turn from our sin. To live in obedience to him. That saves us from the punishment of eternal death. But see, saving us from death was only the beginning. Just like it was with David and Mephibosheth. Saving somebody from death was only the beginning. See, God showed his great mercy by dying for us, but he showed great grace by giving us more than eternal life. When you accept Christ as your Savior, I know a lot of us, we tend to focus on the fact that we're going to be in heaven forever and praise the Lord. That is true. But that's not the only reason why God sent Jesus to die on a cross for you and for me. It's just the beginning. Just as David spared Mephibosheth's life and made him a son... God does the same thing when we accept him as our Savior. See, we stood opposed to God, and God still saved us. God also welcomes us into his family, and he gives us a seat at his table. A seat that only can be occupied by a son or a daughter. And once We have a seat at God's table. Once we have that position of an intimate and personal relationship with God, guess what? It'll never be taken away. We're all going to face God one day. 
We're all going to be summoned to the throne room. And God is going to judge those who choose to remain opposed to him. Those who stay in their rebellion. Those who don't want to do the, uh, the, way, things, the, the, the way God wants things done. The fact is that the fact is enough that, that uh, you know, when we think about this, when we think about what the result is for those who choose to oppose God, there, that there's an eternal separation from God in hell, that gives anybody who's thinking about it sheer anxiety. To know what is coming, to understand the finality of that judgment and that it cannot change and it will be there for all eternity. But see, we don't have to fear coming into the presence of God. We don't have to have great anxiety over God's power and his judgment. We don't have to stress over all that awaits the enemies of God. See, we can come before him like we belong there. Like a son or a daughter. So as you think about that kind of anxiety today, does coming before the presence of God give you principal's office anxiety this morning? If it does, it doesn't have to. See, God's merciful and God's gracious. If you accept him today, you can become a son or a daughter with a seat at God's table. If you already have, don't ever fear to come into his presence because you belong there. And it'll never be taken away. Praise God that he is merciful and gracious. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our God, our Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the, the opportunity to look into your word, to see all the wonderful blessings that you have given to us. But Lord, we also know that for those who choose to reject you, that there is, there is great anxiety to be had. That there is eternal separation from God for all eternity in a place we call hell. God, I do pray that if there is one here today who does not know you as Savior that they would come to terms with that that they would come and speak with somebody so that we can show them how that they can become a son or daughter with a seat at your table and God I pray that your blessing be upon today as we continue to worship you from here Lord, for those of us who do know you as Savior, what an exciting thought it is to one day be in your presence, to have a seat at your table, and to share that intimate time with you. God, may we be living like that matters to us and that it should matter to everyone else. And God, I pray your blessing upon this congregation that you continue to use them as a light in this community. We just pray all these things in Jesus' name.